Good morning, and welcome to the 98th Landon Lecture on Public Issues. We are pleased to have as our speaker this morning the United States Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Espy. First, I would like to introduce some dignitaries here today. We have a number of state legislators here with us today, and as I mention their name, if they would stand up, and then as I finish, we'll give them a round of applause as I finish introducing them. Senator David Corbin, Senator Steve Morris, State Senator Lana Olean, State Senator Janice Hardenberger, and Sid Warner on the Kansas Board of Regents. Sid? We're delighted that our new executive director of the Board of Regents could be here today, Steve Jordan. I know we have in our audience today Adrian Polanski, who is the state director of ASCS. Adrian. We have the Secretary of Agriculture for the state of Kansas, Phil Fishburn. We have the former Secretary of Agriculture, Sam Brownbeck, and the former governor for the state of Kansas, John Carlin. Would you please join me in a round of applause? Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> then let me introduce to you other members of the platform party. On my left, Dr. Aruna Michi, who is Professor of Political Science and President of the Kansas State University Faculty Senate. <laughs> Next to her, Ed Skoog, an undergraduate student in English and President of the Kansas State University student body. <laughs> On my right, Edward Seaton, chairman of the Landon Patrons and owner and publisher of the Manhattan Mercury. Ed? <laughs> then next to him, Dr. Charles Reagan, chairman of the Landon Lecture Series and my executive assistant. Charles? <laughs> Secretary Mike Espy was sworn in as the 25th United States Secretary of Agriculture on January 22, 1993. Prior to being appointed to this position, Mr. Espy represented the second district of Mississippi in the United States House of Representatives. Secretary Espy was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1986, where he served on the Agriculture and Budget Committees. He was chairman of the Domestic Hunger Task Force of the Select Committee on Hunger, the Lower Mississippi Delta Caucus, and the Natural Resources Community and Economic Development Task Force for the House Budget Committee. He was also Majority Whip at large. Mr. Espy put his reinventing government ideas into action for the six years that he served on the House Agricultural Committee. He made numerous proposals to reform agriculture, including measures to cut red tape in the USDA National Appeals Division, to promote the use of food stamps at farmers' markets, and to provide outreach programs for limited resource farmers. Before his election to Congress, Mr. Espy served as the Mississippi Assistant State Attorney General for Consumer Protection from 1984 to 85, Assistant Secretary of Public Lands Division from 1980 to 84, and Assistant Secretary of State for Legal Services from 1978 to 1980. Secretary Espy received a bachelor's degree from Howard University in Washington, D.C. in 1975, and a law degree from the Santa Clara Law School in Santa Clara, California in 1978. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the United States Secretary of Agriculture, Mr. Mike Espy. Thank you. Good morning uh, to, to President Weefall, to the students and to the faculty and 
those within the administration here at Kansas State University, to all of the distinguished uh, alumni and guests, and to uh, distinguished politicians in particular, uh, the State Commission of Agriculture, uh, to all of those on the dais, and to all of you listening uh, by radio, uh, I'm delighted to be here, uh, delighted to be here in Kansas and at this uh, distinguished university, participating in a very important lecture series, the Landon Lecture Series. I have to first uh, thank you for delaying uh, this opportunity for me because, uh, as you know, I was scheduled to, to do this earlier, and I was unable to do it because we were engaged at that point in some very difficult, difficult negotiations in Geneva, Switzerland, on the General Agreement for Tariffs and Trade. I uh, called Dr. Weefald, and uh, he allowed me to delay my appearance here by a month, uh, but I got to tell you, uh, in the Mississippi parlance, forgive my English, but we've done good. <laughs> and I think the delay was well worth it because uh, some things I'm going to tell you this morning um, would suggest to you, hopefully, that, uh, that the interruption was, was well worth it. Uh, in the last month, I've had the privilege of speaking at three distinguished agricultural forums at three distinguished universities. One, I made a day and a half trip to Oxford, England to participate in uh, what they call there the Farmer uh, Agri-Conference, uh, an aggregation of farmers and producers all over uh, Europe. I took my bodyguards with me. I don't use to do that, but in this case I had to because uh, I tried to convince them of the benefit of the gap uh, for them, and uh, many of them were farmers from France, and they didn't want to hear it. Uh, then I came back and I had a chance to, uh, to d talk to distinguished uh, students uh, from all over the world at Harvard uh, in their agribusiness lecture series that they hold once per year. And now I'm here at Kansas State University in our nation's heartland. Uh, so I don't make this comparison lightly because I've seen your list of Rhodes Scholars, your Marshall Scholars, your Truman Scholars, your Goldwater Scholars, and you rank with the best. And I think it said something about this uh, university and the students and the people within the confines of this university. It says a lot about the people of Kansas uh, and the people of this nation that of the three, yours is the public institution, uh, the land grant institution. And I think that's great. Delighted to be the 98th Landon lecturer. Uh, I looked over the roster of those who preceded me here at this lectern, and uh, I noticed that the last two were both ministers, uh, Reverend Pat Robinson and uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson. And so I got those speeches because I wanted to, to be able to read them both and find some commonality to, to use to, for me to... <laughs> couldn't find it. Uh, those gentlemen, though distinguished, uh, have nothing in common. Uh, except for the obvious. So, but that might be okay because, uh, you know, my parents had ambitions for me to become a minister uh, once upon a time. And I'm from Mississippi. I'm from a very large family. I've got two brothers and four sisters. And my parents, like your parents, uh, are you, you are with your children or grandchildren, always had uh, great and lofty ambitions for all of their children. Uh, and they would line us in the back hall of our home every Saturday night. And they would ask us one question, the same question every weekend. They'd go from the oldest daughter to the youngest son, uh, me. And the question was, uh, what do you want to do with your life? And I recall that uh, my oldest sister, Jean, said, uh, Daddy, uh, I want to be a teacher. I want to mold the minds of students. I want to push my students on to the heights of academic excellence. That's great, Jean. Just be the best teacher you could ever be. My oldest brother was named Henry, and they say, Henry, uh, he was named after my father, Henry Jr. Say, Henry, what do you want to do with your life? He said, Daddy, I want to be just like you. I want to manage our family business. And of course, for my father, that was great. You know, he swelled with pride. And they came on down the line until they got to my twin sister, Michelle, 10 minutes older. And they say, Michelle, what do you want to do with your life? She said, oh, I know, I want to be a CPA. I want to be a a CPA, and perhaps if I'm tenacious, if I'm persistent, if I study hard, if I get good grades, perhaps, Daddy, one day I can uh, get a contract managing the finances of a Fortune 500 company. That's great, Michelle, just to be the best CPA you could ever be. And they always got to me. Same question. 
Uh, Mike, what do you want to do? And same answer every Saturday night. I'd say, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and then finally, my father, Henry, turned to my mother, Jean. He said, Jean, instead of giving the boy, you know, this kind of inquisition every week, let's just give him a test. Uh, tomorrow, when he comes home from school, would you be so kind as to place three items on the dining room table? On the left-hand side, put a $20 bill. In uh, the middle, put a bottle of whiskey. And on the end, place a Bible. Because if he comes in and he picks up the money, he just might be a banker. If he comes in and he picks up the whiskey, well, then at least we'll know. He'll be a scoundrel, a ne'er-do-well, but at least we'll know. And if he comes, picks up the, uh, the Bible, oh, he'll be a preacher, a priest, a minister, and what that'd be great. That's what we really want him to do. And so she did as he asked, and the next day, uh, I recall coming in from school, and I ran right towards the kitchen, but I stopped by the dining room table, and I noticed the three items that were sitting there, and I went right for that money. I put it in my pocket, but I took the bottle of whiskey. I put it on the one arm. I took the Bible. I put it on the other. And he said, oh, no, Gene, he's going to be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> so... <clears throat> So maybe they were disappointed, but what can I say? I'm here. Uh, I want to discuss with you, just to have a conversation if I can, for a short period of time. I know that I'm uh, due to take questions, and I want to do that. I want to talk about uh, the state of agriculture. You know, I'm here in the nation's heartland. I'm here in wheat country. Uh, and um, tell some of the dole, I know I'm here in wheat country. In fact, uh, when I was uh, at my confirmation, uh, I was... Uh, it was a very awkward situation. I was very nervous, as I recall, a little bit over a year ago. And um, the panel of senators came in, and they were querying me. And there was one empty seat. And uh, that empty seat was for the senior senator from Kansas. And so finally, he came in. And of course, uh, you know, he's the minority leader. And uh, he came in, and uh, everything stopped. Everything was, became silent. And uh, he strode to his seat, sat down. And uh, in deference to him, uh, he had a chance to ask me a question, interrupting all others. He said, well, Mr. Secretary, and I presume that you're going to be confirmed. I presume that you will be the secretary. Uh, I've studied your background. I know your history. I know where you're from. And I have one question for you. And he said, can you spell wheat? <laughs> uh, yes, sir, Senator, I can spell wheat. But it's been a difficult year for agriculture and for the United States Department of Agriculture. I want to talk about some things that I've seen, some things that we've done, some insights into the future, and discuss with you where I see agriculture going uh, beyond the year 2000. Uh, within the last year, as I told you, it has been difficult for us. It has been difficult for many of you and your parents because uh, we've seen a lot of things going on. First of all, two days after I was confirmed, had to fly to the Pacific Northwest because we had a serious outbreak of a deadly disease. A serious outbreak where three children were sentenced to death and the only crime is that they had eaten a, an undercooked hamburger laced with an E. coli foodborne pathogen. Uh, although we weren't liable at the USDA, uh, I felt morally responsible because somewhere along the line in the food chain, that hamburger had been stamped USDA approved, and we had to do something about it. We went from there to having to deal with um, the problem in the forest management areas uh, within our country, mostly in the Northwest as well. We had uh, aflatoxin in corn in Michigan, uh, problem with Maine potatoes, a med fly in California, cotton problems in Arizona. Of course, we had the flood of the century, a 500-year flood drowning lives and livelihoods all throughout the seven and eight states in the Midwest. At the same time, we had an incredible drought in the South and the Southeast, parching fortunes of farmers. We had a problem with Russian credit. Uh, our policy is to support this emerging democracy, but our taxpayers have a right to expect repayment for, for the largesse we give, and they weren't paying. Of course, you know, with the President's help and under his leadership, we rescued NAFTA, literally pulled it from the dead. And um, 
Then, of course, the GATT, the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade, late night sessions and smoke-filled rooms. And, of course, throughout this whole time, we had to manage the massive USDA bureaucracy uh, with 14,000 offices in the United States and around the world, 11,000 in the United States, uh, 110,000 employees, a $71 billion budget, a $36 billion bank, and I'm trying to downsize it. I'm trying to reduce it. I'm trying to consolidate it while at the same time wondering whether that certain powerful senator with his hands on that certain uh, appropriation that I want would really uh, be angry if I would close his local office. You know? So that's what we've uh, been through over the last year. I've perhaps traveled to 45 states, uh, maybe 10 or 12 countries in that time. And uh, it's been tough. It's been busy. And I know I'm in Kansas, and I try to adopt Dorothy's strategy. I try to click my heels three times, and nothing happened. You know, I, I didn't get back to Mississippi. But we've had challenges, but I would prefer to call them opportunities. Opportunities to keep our promise to the American people. Opportunities to keep our promise to the American producers. Uh, opportunities to be judged on our deeds and not just on our promises. I want to review with you, as I said, just uh, briefly how I think we've kept these, these promises. Uh, when I was sitting in the Senate room, I made some promises on behalf of this president. I promised that, first of all, we would promote farm income, because that is, after all, the bottom line. Secondly, we would aggressively seek out new markets to lock in our historic share and to push open these doors and to knock down these trade barriers to sell more of what we produce and what we raise around the world. Thirdly, I promised that I would ensure that at whatever table, wherever within the cabinet or within the intra-agencies where agriculture would be discussed, we'd be there, no matter if it was against EPA or FDA or Corps of Engineers or State Department, if it involved agriculture, we would be there. Fourthly, we promised to, to have America pay more attention to rural America, those who live in urban areas and suburban areas, uh, inside the council halls where we talk about the information superhighway or the health care bill, our welfare reform, our enterprise zones. I wanted to re remind urban and suburban America that rural America Hey, we still exist, you know, and 30% of the population of this nation live and want to live in less populated areas and deserve and expect to be brought into the conversation. And lastly, fifth promise is a promise that I made to the president uh, before he took his oath of office and before I was confirmed. I sat uh, with him in Little Rock in the governor's mansion before the fireplace, and I promised him that I would downsize the United States Department of Agriculture, that we would achieve real savings with real money to this bureaucracy, that I would cut out a lot of that silly spending that you read about in the Reader's Digest, you know, where we pay someone to grade the stems of pickles and pay someone to, uh, to measure the flow rate of ketchup. Uh, spend a million dollars on a yearbook that no one ever really reads. Well, in fact, I promised him that we would encourage um, a healthy diet, you know, whether it's uh, uh, to our school children and the school lunch program, but basically we would encourage a healthy fiscal diet and that we would practice what we preach. Well, it's a year later. And I've got to tell you, I think that uh, we have fulfilled most of these promises. Of course, uh, we've got some time to go. But if this speech, and it's not a speech, if this uh, comment, this discussion I'm having with you had a title, I would entitle it uh, Promises Made, Promises Kept. Income, farm income, don't look now. But uh, the month ending December 30th, 1993, prices are all up over last year at the same period except for cattle and hogs. Uh, why? Well, we see corn at $3 a bushel, soybeans hovering around $7, wheat at $4, rice so up, certainly. Uh, cotton up 21.4%. And to be fair, 
to be fair, those agronomists here and those, uh, those of you familiar with uh, agricultural pricing realize that Mother Nature had an awful lot to do with this. We had a Midwest flood, we have a southeastern drought, the yields are lower, the carryover stocks are tighter, and the prices have responded. But uh, those of you who choose to be objective, and that's most of you, have to realize that the government also did its part. Because of our accurate forecasting and surveys, uh, we gave the market some confidence that we, you know, we, we, we knew what we were talking about. We intervened with early help in the weather-related tragedies in the Midwest. We changed many of our farm programs, extending deadlines ad infinitum, giving farmer greater amounts of flexibility to make their own production decisions. Uh, we distributed disaster checks in record time, where it used to take three months, we did it in a week, with a greater software package, and that was all that it took, and a different attitude among our workers. We opened the farmer's own reserve to the maximum level. We changed our interest rates, lowering them and then lowering them once more. Suspending farmer's home foreclosures, uh, our ARP announcements, acreage, acreage reduction program announcements, zero for corn, 11% for cotton, gave signals to the markets and the banks rely upon those markets that uh, we wouldn't just run out of town and follow the TV cameras. We would remain, we would stay there as a full partner with the victims until substantial recovery had been achieved. We think the prices that, that uh, I quoted will remain firm well into the growing season. That gives the agricultural lending community some comfort and uh, cash flow prospects of producers themselves some comfort. I know that we're not over the difficult period. We have levies to rebuild continually. We, got, we have wetlands policy to establish. We have decisions to make. Uh, we have to reform our crop insurance program to uh, encourage participation, to uh, allow it to be more affordable, make it more flexible, more sensible. And we have a plan uh, at the OMB right now, and I believe that it's going to be announced very soon. But the fact is that uh, I've been into that region 20, oh, 23 times since January 2nd, and I've talked to most of these producers. You know, we had a flood inundating 8 million acres. Uh, affecting negatively 21 million acres. And most of the farms I've talked to are satisfied. You know, it's a difficult time, but they're satisfied that we kept our promise. Second promise, we kept, uh, we have been aggressive in these international markets. The government responded, the government intervened. We have improved demand outcomes. And this is an area that you can't just leave to market forces alone because you have the European Union heavily subsidizing their farmers. We have the Canadians to our north heavily subsidizing their farmers with rail subsidies and so forth. So government must come in and do what it can to impact policy. Now, you've heard these speeches. I've given these speeches. If we had a level playing field, we could do this. And if we had a level playing field, we could do that. The fact is, because of NAFTA and GATT, and I think it will be passed, we now have a more level playing field than ever before. And I'll tell you, like I tell producers all over the world, uh, even in, in Europe, that in a fair fight, we will win. And it's our responsibility to make that fight as fair as possible. Think about it. American rice. American rice is now being eaten right now in Japanese households. Rice grown dominantly in California, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, and other places. But I'm amazed there because two years ago, uh, our own USDA officials were arrested when they tried to exhibit a small packet of rice in a Japanese trade show. And now it's coming in. And because of GATT, we have the prospect for a permanent arrangement with regard to rice. Korea is next. And they didn't want to do it, but they're doing it. American apples and um, other tree fruit are now finding uh, legitimate market status in the People's Republic of China. Uh, I had a chance to go there in October. We talked about apples. We talked about wheat. And now 
There's a breaking of a 30-year ban on TCK wheat going into the People's Republic of China. All I'm trying to do is tell you that we have been aggressive and we have tried to use trade and agricultural trade as a diplomatic tool, not as a weapon, not as a stick, but as a carrot to bring along with it this incre increased trade opportunities, advances in nuclear nonproliferation, and greater things in the area of human rights and the extension of most favorite nation. You've heard a lot about the NAFTA. Let me tell you that um, that was no sucking sound you heard. Ross Perot was wrong. Uh, you didn't hear a sucking sound. You heard a bucking sound because NAFTA is now into effect, and NAFTA has had a, bucky, a buck up effect on farm prices, particularly corn prices. Because the markets, again, in anticipation of greater market openings and greater demand, you know, are finding places. And the price has gone up in many ways because of that. The advantages of NAFTA. You know, the first time in history we have an open system for trade of agricultural products of all kinds between the United States and Mexico. We're still working on Canada. I hadn't licked that one yet, but we're moving forward. Mexico's 14% tariffs will be reduced to zero by the year 2008. Mexico's requirements for import licenses, which allow the government to control the quantity of imports, is gone, wiped away the first day NAFTA became effective. And now we have the opening of a 90 million person market with a growing middle class whose taste and buying power are really not unlike our own, no matter what you've heard. We can expect some immediate benefits, and I've, we've seen them. Mexico's cattle and beef tariffs of 15 to 25 percent were eliminated on January 1st, and we look for an increase of 75,000 tons in beef trade alone. We also expect a 270 percent increase in corn exports in 1994. That's over and above what our exports would have been without the NAFTA, of course, and our farm exports to Mexico would likely be $4 billion in 1994 and rise to 10 billion when NAFTA is fully implemented. And as good as it is and as proud as we are, it pales in comparison to what we did in Geneva. We broke the log jam. You know, they always said agriculture's a problem. You know, for seven years, we didn't have a Uruguay route agreement because of agriculture. Well, we don't have that anymore. We now have 117 nations all holding hands, agreeing to walk down the slippery slope of subsidy reductions, all agreeing to liberalize markets, particularly markets in agriculture. In the area of market access, every nation, the industrial nations and the developing nations, all agreeing to eliminate all protective non-tariff barriers and replace them with tariffs. All GATT countries agreed to reduce the tariffs by an average of 36 percent. 24% for developing countries, for all agricultural products by the year 2000. And look, all of these politically motivated sanitary and phytosanitary barriers that kept our apples from going in Japan, that kept our fruit from going into China, if China was a GATT country. All of these barriers are sometimes used by other countries to restrict our products. They now must be based on sound science and not just wishful thinking of the politicians. This access will increase exports of a wide variety for U.S. ag exports ranging from beef, pork, poultry, apples, grapes, pears, nuts, almonds, other fruits and vegetables, and Uruguay Round Agreement is also great for wheat and feed grains because nations agreed to reduce the volume of subsidized exports by 21 percent and value by 36 percent by the year 2000 from 1986 to 90 base levels. This will eliminate much of the unfair competition we face in grains trade, beef trade, and trade in dairy products. Over the period 1995 to the year 2000, the European Union, our main competitor here, will have to reduce their subsidized wheat exports by about 25 million tons from the 1991-92 levels and coarse grain exports by about 7 million tons this will provide new opportunity to expand U.S. exports. Third promise, 
that you know, we wouldn't let other agencies just get away with well, what they've done in the past, that we would be at the table when agriculture came up, that we would not shirk or shy away from our responsibilities. We would debate the EPA, the Corps of Engineers, the State Department, whomever, about agriculture. Well, we've had some successes. We've had some failures. But even though we've had some failures, I've got to tell you, they knew they were in a fight. EPA, methyl bromide, uh, it uh, would take me too long to get into it. But methyl bromide uh, is a soil fumigant and an export applicant, uh, very necessary for competition purposes. And they were about to take it and make uh, the manufacturers cease manufacturing and use by 1996. And we said, it doesn't make any sense. So we worked with them. We talked to them, not at them. We decided to use the Clinton philosophy of working with one another. And uh, we reached a good solution. Everyone is generally happy with this solution. Uh, there will be no use or manufacture, any cessation at all, until the year 2001. And that gives me enough time to, to do the research, to target the research dollars, to come up with an alternative, if necessary, ought to prove that it's well within the realm of sound science. Uh, pesticide tolerances, Delaney Clause, we won, because zero tolerance really is impossible to reach. Ethanol, very important for corn country. Mandating a future for corn and non-feed uses for corn in this uh, Clean Air Act and the nation's future for reformulated gasoline. Corps of Engineers on wetlands policy. We said, look, the farmers don't want to go to three or four different agencies for the same thing. Corps of Engineers here and EPA here and agriculture here. Let's have one agency for the determination of wetlands. And now we have it, the Soil Conservation Service. We fought with Interior on rangelands policy, on ecosystem management. We fought with the State Department on all of these emerging markets, whether we would target emerging markets or emerging democracies. Could we just target a few more countries with some capacity for foreign exchange and not just deal with countries with uh, a certain lack of credit worthiness? Do you focus on market political reform or market reform? How do you use your EAP, your MPP, your GSM? We fought with OMB. The OMB, I call it the uh, omnipotent agency. Uh, to try to work with them to develop the balance between funding for agriculture. Because in my budget, $71 billion, three-fourths of the money goes to feeding programs. And most of them are entitlement programs. Food stamps, uh, school lunch, school breakfast, daycare. Okay, you got that, then you have programs for research and farm production. How much uh, balance do we need? How do we rededicate certain dollars in, in a shrinking pie in order to encourage agriculture to remain competitive? And knowing that we're entering an era of decline in subsidies and an area where folks are calling for reduction in pesticides and where we're trying to protect our topsoil, incredibly difficult questions but we've been at the table. Fourth promise, uh, all of these promises made, promises kept. Fourth promise on rural development. Uh, I'm nearing the end of my time here. I want to take questions, but I got to tell you, pay attention to what we've done. Information superhighway, healthcare, welfare reform. Uh, last week, the president and vice president announced our enterprise zone policy, where we have the ability to designate through an applications process, about 105 enterprise communities and enterprise zones. Of the zones, three in rural America, six in urban America. Of the communities, about 60 in urban America, 30 in rural America. Each zone will have about $38 million poured into it in Title 20 grants and wage credits and tax credits and waivers and bond exempt authority. And we have embarked on this period to build up rural America, to tie rural America into the information superhighway, to try to tie it into GATT and NAFTA, where we are now focusing on value-added products, which adds 550,000 jobs and exports. 
I'd like for a lot of the value-added companies to locate closer to the areas of raw production. And if I can use the enterprise zone money to do this, uh, we're, we're simply going to do it. Reorganization is the last point I'd like to make. Well, it's tough to close an office, let me tell you. It is tough. I had to go and get my black belt in Taekwondo uh, July 31st to try to deal with this one because in America, we have 3,600 counties and parishes, but the USDA has 11,000 county offices. All right? We're trying to, we're trying to close 1,300. We're trying to um, encourage our great USDA employee population to uh, some to consider early retirement. We have decided to cut our workforce by 8,500. I'm taking the first cut in Washington. I don't want to have to come here to Kansas to tell you, you've got to close, you've got to consolidate, and you first thing you'd ask me is, what have you done in Washington? Well, we're taking the first hit, and a bigger hit than anywhere else. I am eliminating 13 agencies. We're going from 43 agencies to 30. And it starts next week, February 8th, when the House of Representatives marks up my package. We are consolidating based on mission and not acronym. We're trying to save you $2.5 billion, and that's real money. We're focusing on six missions, only six. We want to take care of our farm programs and international sales, do something about rural development, food and nutrition. We have to do a better job in inspecting our meat and poultry. Fifth, conservation and environment, and six, you know, research, economics, and doing the kind of analysis it takes to keep everything going. Uh, so, we've had a tough year, we've had a difficult year, but we are focused, we are on the path, we know what we're doing, we know where we're going, and uh, I'm really proud that I can stand up here and talk about promises kept, you know, because politicians usually come up and say they're going to do something and you turn around and they hope that you don't remember what they said they do because they didn't do it. Uh, promises made, promises kept. As I move to questions, let me quickly say to you, look into the future, the three areas that we must absolutely specialize in, dominate, if we're going to remain competitive in the world community, the global economic and agriculture community. Three areas very quickly. First of all, trade. Trade because we are so incredibly efficient that our domestic supply outstrips our domestic demand. We can't eat everything we grow. We just simply can't do it, and 30 percent of the harvested acreage is sold abroad. A third of the cash receipts are found in the international marketplace. And as I said, 550,000 off-farm jobs and 350,000 on-farm jobs are dedicated just to exports alone. And so we don't have any choice. Uh, that's where we are going, and we are bullish on these export opportunities. Because as the cash receipts go up, the cost of these government programs go down. In 1986, agriculture exports only valued about $26 billion, and that was the same cost of the program in 86, $26 billion. But in 1992, during a more robust export period, where we valued about $42 billion in exports, the farm programs only cost you $10 billion. So it's a great inverse relationship, and one that we should seek to continue. We're optimistic about our export opportunities, because um, even though the bulk sales will decrease by $800 million, be more than offset by the export in value-added products. NAFTA, as I said, is a boon, and it really has helped us, and uh, we're really fortunate uh, that the Congress passed this instrument. In market access, again in GATT very quickly, we're going to see rapidly expanded markets in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, Latin America. We hoped uh, to see the entrance of countries like China, Russia, Taiwan into the GATT, where they have to liberalize their trade policies to enter the, what we call the WTO, the World Trading Organization. And a lot of these phytosanitary barriers will continue to fall. Great prospects for market access for grains and for wheat and for many, many commodities. Secondly, in, in, in we got to dominate biotechnology. New uses for crops 
like ethanol, soybean ink. In the USDA, we practice what we preach. Nothing is printed on non-soybean ink. We use soybean ink in everything we print, in-house and out-contracted. I hope you heard about an announcement we made two weeks ago where scientists in Clay County, Nebraska, it's not a huge metropo uh, metropolitan, 816 people in Clay County, Nebraska, announced breakthrough science. We beat the New Zealanders, the Australians, the EC, in announcing the world's first complete genetic map for cattle and swine. Why is that important? Because we can now determine the first in the world to determine the precise location of genes that control desirable traits in cattle, like fast growth, meat tenderness, lower fat, and resistance to disease, E. coli. Hopefully in five years, we don't have to deal with this problem because uh, the animals growing up won't have it in the first place. Safer meat, resistant to microbes. Basic research that only the government can really do. It's just so incredibly expensive, it can't be done anywhere else. Well, we've done it, we've offered it to the American private industry, and they snapped it up. And then lastly, as I quickly move out of time, uh, we have to get used to it. Uh, no matter how we cry and beat our chests, uh, you know, it's just coming. Americans care more about what's in their food, what's on their food, where it was grown, when it was grown, how it's labeled, than ever before in our history. And all of us who are involved in agriculture, and that's all of us because we all eat, uh, we, in the production side, in the distribution side, in the regulation side, everyone among the food chains just got to get used to it. Uh, we have the safest food supply in the world. I'll say this anywhere, but it certainly could be made safer still. Uh, so I'm about through, but I started with my father, and let me end with my father because uh, I made promise to you and made a promise to President Clinton, made a promise to the producers around the country, but I made a promise to my father that, um, that I would fulfill his legacy. Now, he's no longer living, but he started his career in agriculture. Uh, he graduated from a college in uh, Alabama, and uh, he took his first job in Arkansas as a Negro County Extension agent, only responsible for a few black farmers in that county uh, he worked there from 1937 to 1943. I wasn't born until 1953, so he had since departed that occupation. And we didn't talk about it much, to be honest with you, as uh, I was coming up, but uh, the first week at USDA, I grabbed the hand of an archivist, and I said, show me the way to the vault. I wanted to try to find my father's papers. I wanted to see, you know, what he cared about and what he wrote about and what he talked about. Now, what he wanted to do for those Negro County agents, you know, 50 years ago. And I am here, his son, 50 years later, with a few more resources at my disposal and, uh, and with the authority over production policy impacting farmers of all races, uh, no matter what hue, religion, occupation. Uh, you know, I feel proud about that. And uh, I found his papers. And very quickly, he wrote about five things. Increase in farm income, uh, assisting his farm in the development of vi viable operations so that the kids wouldn't have to necessarily leave the farm. There'd be cash flow opportunities on the farm. Secondly, he wanted the USDA his farmers could trust, you know, and that was a different period, but I got to tell you, he wrote about information that could be relied upon and that would not change just like the weather. Thirdly, uh, he wanted to try to find new markets and new outlets for crops grown there in Arkansas. And fourth, he wanted to create a more stable rural environment. Uh, folks there at that time had, uh, you know, outdoor plumbing and, and uh, tar paper shacks, no hospitals. And although we've come a far piece since then, but the fact is that I'm from Mississippi, and I know that we still have tar paper shacks, outdoor plumbing, no running water. And, uh, and lastly, he... he um, he really wrote that he wished the rest of America could appreciate agriculture, would not take it for granted. They don't have to understand, you know, the problems inherent in agriculture. And so the same goals he had 50 years ago are the same goals I have now, same things I talked about today. 
emphasis on improvements in farm income, opening international markets, uh, giving our farmers the benefit of the doubt, servicing their needs cheerfully, responsibly, capably, with confidence, pushing science, the envelope on science, giving the folks a USDA that you can trust and rely upon and be proud of, and somehow emphasizing to most Americans who live in suburbia and urban, urbanites that, uh, you know, cotton shirts just don't grow on racks at the Kmart. And uh, apples just don't somehow spring up at the bend of the A&P. Well, uh, I think we've done a lot of the things we talked about, and you know, we've got three more years to go in this administration, and hopefully the next one, but I tell you, I'm mighty proud of the promises we made and the promises we kept to, to you, uh, to the students at this great university, to the, all of those listening to this Landon lecture, uh, to President Clinton, but most of all, to my father. Thank you for allowing me to be here. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very, very much. And I think we would have time for two or three questions, and the mics, as you know, if you've been here before, are on your left or right. So if you have any questions, the appropriate mics are there. Okay, maybe I answered it all. Yes, sir. Can't hear you. Just shout it. You say you, I didn't catch the first part of your question. You, you are an unemployed, is it underemployed? Oh, okay. Uh, USDA worker or? Uh, corporate. Corporate, okay, Process sure. Processing. Well, uh, the, the question generally goes to um, our ability as a regulator to, uh, to, to assure safe food and the labeling of safe food and such. I've got to tell you, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of things government shouldn't do. <laughs> there are a lot of things government shouldn't do, but this whole area of food safety is something we've got to get involved in. Uh, uh, those, those three little children in the Pacific Northwest who ate the undercooked hamburger no longer living, uh, followed on by deaths in, uh, in Texas, New Jersey, New York, and uh, I'm going to tell you, I found out that 150 to 280 kids die each year because of E. coli. I never knew that before I went to the USDA. And uh, we simply have to do a better job. We can't inspect our meat and poultry in 1994 the same way we did it in 1934. We have to move from this system we have, which is organoleptic, you know, sight, sound, smell, touch, to microbiology. Because you can't see a germ, but it's just as deadly. Uh, so we're in this big time, and we've done a whole lot of things I can't get into to make sure we keep better records, to put more inspectors on the line, to move to rapid screening tests, to label, to teach and encourage American consumers how to freeze food, how to prepare food, how to wash hands. You know, our mothers told us these things, but somehow we've got to keep it emphasized to the forefront, because if not, you know, I was in New York the other day uh, speaking to a room full of E. coli parents. And uh, one mother was so sorrowful because her three-year-old child died last year because she had a meatball given to her <laughs> in a plate of spaghetti from her mother's kitchen. She never went to a fast food franchise. And so we just have to do a better job. Uh, and so in general, this is an area that we are sincere about doing something. Uh, I want to work with industry to make sure that uh, what we require is you know, commercially reasonable and not that costly, 
But the fact is that when it comes to, uh, you know, the pursuit of profit on a, in a zealous basis or the pursuit of human health, uh, I'm probably going to come down on the side of human health. Thank you. Yeah. Let's take one over here and then we'll come back over there. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Secretary Espy, this doesn't deal with your agency, but it deals with the issue of international agricultural research and production. My understanding is that uh, the contribution that the United States is planning to make to uh, the Consortium for International Agricultural Research uh, under the foreign aid budget is scheduled to go down by 50 percent, at least. These are the initial uh, uh, plans, I believe, of, of the OMB. And I'm wondering whether uh, uh, what I say is, is correct. And if so, if you think that maybe something needs to be done about this in light of the fact that uh, very often we're talking about different ecological zones, different technologies, and often the kind of research we do here does not really apply sure. to the countries of Latin America, Africa, and Asia. I understand the question. I hope you work with me here and that you can understand that uh, I'm not at complete liberty to discuss specifics on the budget which has not yet been unveiled. Uh, in fact, I'm under sort of a semi-gag order from the OMB not to, uh, not to say much about the budget because it, they hadn't been presented. Uh, however, uh, in the area of research, I can say to you, sir, that this is an area that we are keen on uh, as we reduce our program costs and uh, move away from subsidization of agriculture. We have to keep agriculture competitive through research, you know, being on the cutting edge. And as I said in the example of the genome map, that took a lot of research, hugely expensive, and uh, we did it, and we're, we're going to keep doing it. So with regard to domestic research, I can, uh, I can indicate to you that, you know, we are keen on it, and uh, I'm... Uh, I'm optimistic. Now, international research, uh, you may see a reduction there. Uh, I can't say what, what you're saying is untrue. Uh, but uh, I'd much rather keep uh, our universities and our domestic uh, colleges uh, with research capacity uh, with something to do rather than uh, spending some dollars that could be spent here in uh, UN programs necessarily for programs that could be done here. One more. Yes. <clears throat> My name is Jim Dugan. I'm a beef and grain producer from Kansas. And listening to your speech, Mr. Espy, I have the same concerns as your father, only my concern is, as a producer, I see our ability to get the job done really degrading. You go out here and you look at the equipment that we have to work with, and the guys can't trade it off because they're not making any money. I think we should address one subject, and that is the profitability of the producer in agriculture. And if we can get that done, we can right a lot of the things that are wrong. Thank you. I agree with you. Uh, that was the first part of my comment here. Farm income must continue to increase uh, because, uh, you know, as a government, we have, we've got virtually nothing to say about the overhead cost. You know, maybe input cost, maybe, you know, cost of your chemicals and your application process, maybe, but you know, I, I don't have anything to do with the, what a combine costs, really. That's the private market, and it should be. But I can help the income to go up. And what we do is uh, we help income to go up by two ways that I know of right away. One is uh, export policy, and I talked about that. The NAFTA has had an, a beneficial impact on corn prices that I can see. Corn prices are now up a bit because of the increased demand and the market anticipates this demand will increase. Ethanol, where we mandate a 30% presence in the nation's reformulated fuse program, uh, you know, makes that, uh, tells our producers that the government will assure them of a market for the corn that they grow. Uh, you know, millions of gallons of ethanol will be used in uh, our nation's reformulated fuse program. And that's, uh, you know, that's demand, and that's price, uh, price impacting. And, uh, and we, you know, we're just going to keep doing that. Uh, I talked about soybean ink, and that's a wave of the future. And I could go, you know, give you 12 or 13 examples, but, uh, but I agree with you. Secondly, uh, in addition to export policy, secondly, this, this matter of uh, farm programs, you know, loan rates and uh, 
and certain other areas that I have discretionary authority over. Uh, we are, <laughs> this is another area that I'm under sort of a instructions, not to say much about, but uh, we've made some recommendations to OMB on loan rates, and uh, that will at least give farmers some money up front to uh, make their purchases and make their plans uh, uh, early on when they sign up for these programs. And, uh, you know, they're, uh, let me just say that uh, I'm sure you're a smart guy, and you've been following the loan rate policy, and you know that over the last several years, under a different administration, uh, they kept it at the absolute lowest level, rock bottom. And uh, being very careful here, let me tell you that there are only two ways that uh, this could go, up or down. And if it's at the lowest level, and I've made a recommendation on a change, you can just about bet it's going a different way. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mike. Okay, you want to put the water away? You've got water. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for coming to Manhattan, Kansas, and to be our 98th Landon Lecturer. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Good afternoon. I could imagine you have any questions. Well, it's good to be back in Kansas. and. Uh, I've been here before, uh, particularly uh, as, as related to the flood that uh, <clears throat> everyone had here this summer. Uh, come back as many times as necessary to take care of that continuing tragedy to help in the recovery. Uh, you heard the speech. Uh, I talked about uh, some things that we've done in the USDA to keep our promises, promises we made at the beginning of the year. I think we kept many, many, many of them, uh, and we're still working. We're still working on them. Uh, the highlights, though, are really what we've done in international trade that will greatly benefit uh, agricultural commodities and uh, livestock grown here in the Midwest and grown here in particular in Kansas. So I'm really proud of it and uh, don't mind saying so. I will take questions. Sir. Secretary, the, uh, will the White House push for an EPA rule that would give ethanol a share of uh, reformulated fuel programs? We've done it. Sure. Uh, I, I answered it in part in the last question. Uh, there is a rulemaking procedure going on now that I predict will end up with uh, ethanol having a mandated future in the government's reformulated fuels program of 30 percent or more. The least it will be <coughs> is 30 percent, and that will benefit uh, corn producers. Uh, corn prices have already gone up because of the market's anticipation that this is happening. Uh, I can't quote you the figures, but uh, we have millions of gallons of ethanol that will be produced uh, because it will be integrated into the, the uh, reformulated fuse program. So I would uh, give you an unqualified yes on that one. Observation Reserve Program. Has USDA come to any decision on what its policy is going to be on the future of that program? Um, yes, basically. Uh, although we're still debating it, uh, the, the question is not whether we'll have it, but how much of it we can afford. Uh, in my opinion, it's a viable program. It's proven its worth. And it's very clear to see that uh, when we begin moving toward the 1995 Farm Bill, it'll be impacted by three things. One, you know, the cost of the programs. So it's pretty much a budgetary discussion. Number two, the impact of all of these international trading agreements, such as GATT and NAFTA. And thirdly, um, impacts concerning the environment and conservation. And uh, I've not talked to anyone in this government that would frown on uh, the beneficial aspects of the CRP. Uh, now, a lot of these leases are expiring, and the question now becomes whether we can re-enroll them. I would favor re-enrolling them. The question is working with the OMP and getting enough money to do it. But again, the answer is we favor it, and I'd love to see it continue, and I believe it will. Yes, sir. Mr. Secretary, you spoke about rural development. The EZEC program that you have is great for a lot of states, but I don't know that it really fits Kansas. What do you have that would work for Kansas? Why wouldn't it work in Kansas? A couple of reasons, because I think one of the criteria is out-migration. 
you have to have a limited out migration. We have some of that in our rural areas. And also the wealth factor in Kansas. I think that despite the fact that we're losing population, we still have a good share of wealth in Kansas. Okay, well, I was in a meeting yesterday with the vice president, who is the chairman of the board of the, what we call the, uh, you know, the Enterprise Community Board of Directors. Uh, he serves as the uh, chairman. We have the chairman of the NEC and the chairman of the Domestic Policy Council as vice chairman. And then Secretary Henry Cisneros and I serve as what they call designating secretaries. And then you have uh, most of the rest of the cabinet, Secretary of the Interior, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary of Labor, mm -hmm. and uh, SBA, and so forth. We discussed criteria yesterday. And uh, this matter about migration is something to be expected. Uh, I come from rural Mississippi, and uh, there's a great, uh, th there's been a great level of out-migration over the years. That's understandable because, uh, you know, people uh, have to go where jobs are and where the dollars are, and it's the same for Kansas as it is for Mississippi. So this matter of out-migration is not such a criteria that would stifle uh, the consideration of Kansas within the Rural Enterprise Zone Program. Uh, you know, the problem is that w the, the dollars are very limited, and we, we wanted to, f to, f to focus these dollars. We, we, we would rather not sprinkle a little bit of money over, over large territory. We would much rather get a, wa a <coughs> substantial amount of money and make a difference, and that's what we are trying to do. Uh, the application process has already started. Uh, again, as I said, three rural zones and 30 rural communities. The rural zones have about $35 million, tax credits, wage credits, waivers, Title 20 money, and uh, the rural communities also qualify. So we, we are uh, taking applications. Yes? Do you see money going for uh, helping sustain the small markets, niches, the uh, value-added programs? Absolutely. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the speech, uh, the growth in agriculture the strength in agriculture, the improvement in farm income is absolutely tied to the strength and the degree to which we pursue these export markets. And uh, within the future of export marketing, uh, we will see some reduction in bulk sales, but more than offset by increase in value added and processed foods. That is the future, more than anything, of uh, agriculture. And we are helping to target these markets. We're helping in marketing. We're helping in our programs like MPP, Marketing Promotion Program, uh, programs like GSM, and, uh, and EAP for bulk sales mostly. So yes, ma'am, there's a great future in value added, and we are, we're right on that one. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, ma'am. <laughs> you mentioned a couple of things during your speech. One, that uh, production is outpacing demand domestically. Right. And also that Americans are more conscious and want to know where their products are coming from, how they're made. Right. With regard to those two issues, BST becomes available tomorrow. How do you explain the decision not to label containers to let consumers know where it's coming from and how it's being made? And why need for more milk production if demand is already out, or if supply is already outpacing demand? That's a great question. Uh, I wish the FDA commissioner was here to take that question because, as you know, they, uh, they made the decision. It all came out of the Food and Drug Administration, not the USDA. And uh, there was a study done by the OMB and not the USDA. And basically, the OMB <coughs> basically said uh, that uh, this uh, BST was not harmful to human health and would not have a uh, deleterious or uh, negative economic impact on, uh, on production, our producers. Um, uh, I, you know, uh, to be honest with you, I have not completely read that report. N you know, not trying to evade your question, but I really have not read it completely since we didn't write it. Uh, I'm reading it now, and I don't have much information on the labeling side of it. Uh, that, again, is a decision that FDA is, is going to make, so I'm going to have to punt on that one right now. We have time for one more question. This, yeah, this hand Mr. Up. Secretary, uh, what can you tell us definitively about the crop insurance program in the way of revamping it maybe coming down the line? What would be changed, and if so, when? I spent a whole lot of time around America throughout the summer in the Midwest states for the flood and in the south and southeastern states for the drought. 
a whole lot of time talking producers in the midst of a disaster. And what I found out that our crop insurance program is itself a disaster. Um, we have low rates of participation because for two reasons. The premiums are too high. Uh, we have some insane um, regulations. And thirdly, if I can add it, uh, the farmers believe that if they have a disaster, that uh, the Congress will ante up. And that has a chilling effect on risk management. Uh, I think that we have to do everyone a favor. And I think we have done it. We have created, we are through, basically, with our program. It has not been announced because I'm trying to find a way to pay for it. Uh, what I want to do is going to cost about $700 million more million than what the present program costs because I would like to raise the subsidy level from 30% to 50%. Uh, and then the premiums will be reduced okay, to the farmer, which makes it more attractive for people to get in. Uh, secondly, we had layers of flexibility so that they can buy up to whichever amount of coverage they like, and it'll be purchased through the private market. Um, thirdly, we, uh, we add in the prevented planning coverage and the catastrophic coverage because it's crazy what happened here in the Midwest. Uh, you know, farmers that have been paying premiums and taking insurance for years and years and years, uh, and when they need it, they're told they're not covered. It's like a pre-existing illness in a health policy. Uh, you had to, you only can get a benefit for crop loss. In order to have a crop loss, you have to have a crop planted. And when the water's on your land and what Mississippi mud's all on your land, you can't plant. So they're not covered. Doesn't make any sense. So we've added in prevented planting. We've added in catastrophic coverage. Now, here's the problem. It costs $700 million more million at least. Uh, I have the OMB saying yes. We'll and uh, now, now I've got to go to the appropriations committees and try to find the money. That's, that's what's taking the time. Secondly, I've been a legislator, and uh, it's awful hard to harness the will of politicians wanting to help their constituents. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I've been a you know, Congress for seven years. The problem is, is that if there's an unbridled opportunity for, for, for benefits to be given in a tragedy, that still will have the chilling effect on participation. So I'd like to have some sort of a threshold. You know, in, in order for, in order for a, a benefit to be given beyond what exists in the crop program, there must be, let's say, two-thirds, excuse me, 62% uh, 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 of the vote in the Senate and two-thirds of the vote in the House, okay? Otherwise, you're only limited to what's in the crop insurance program. If it's a huge tragedy that's uh, multi-state and hugely expensive, then, then you go beyond that remedy and maybe even go off budget. But there's got to be some discipline in the system, and that's not quite what we have yet. And we're, we're pursuing that discipline with them. It's awful hard to talk someone into giving up power, you know? Awful hard. But we're trying. Yes? Mr. Secretary. Last question. Could you please uh, shed some light on the state of negotiations on the Canadian media reports? Mm -hmm. uh, and what kind of offers on the table? Oh, boy. <clears throat> I was unable to do the Landon Lecture Series earlier because I was in Geneva, and I met with, uh, gosh, you know, we, we met with most of the 117 and so forth. So. So we didn't reach an agreement. Uh, since then, I've been to Ottawa once, and the Canadians have been to Washington to my office once. And uh, in all honesty, we have not yet reached an agreement. The problem is that uh, we have seen a uh, great influx of Canadian grains, particularly the wheat, uh, over the last uh, oh, three or four years. Recently, negotiating with them in good faith and we just don't have a solution yet. Thank you.